This lesson is going to review some of what we already know about dimensioning technical drawings, and it's going to introduce a few new terms and dimensioning styles that we haven't used yet. It might seem simple, even a little boring, but dimensioning is a critical part of the language of technical drawings. Knowing how to correctly read and write dimensions is a must-have skill for anyone who wants to work in technology and engineering. If your dimensioning skills are a little rusty, you might want to go back and review the lesson on dimensioning basics before we begin. If you're ready, let's get started. Technical drawings would be very difficult to understand if everyone drew and dimensioned them in their own way. To eliminate confusion, groups of smart people have developed standards for dimensioning, or rules for how to do it, so that everyone is doing it the same way. Standards help reduce confusion, but there's several different organizations who create standards, and they don't always do things the same way. In the U.S., the most commonly used standards for dimensioning are ANSI standards, short for the American National Standards Institute. The ISO, or International Organization for Standardization, is used by most industrialized nations that use the metric system. Other countries and organizations might use systems of standards that are different from those. Let's review the basic components of a typical linear dimension. First are extension lines. These lines extend from the edge of the object that the dimension is referring to. There's always a small gap between the extension line and the object, so we don't confuse the two. If two dimensions refer to the same edge of the object, as shown here, the extension line for that edge is extended further, and the larger dimension is placed outside the smaller one but we don't see two extension lines extending from the same edge. Next are the dimension lines. These lines are usually positioned between the extension lines, pointing out and touching the extension lines that they refer to exactly. Dimension lines have a space in the middle where the dimension text goes. The arrowheads on dimension lines should be small, pointy, and filled in. They touch the extension line they refer to exactly, so there's no confusion which edge of the object the dimension is referring to. The dimension text is written in the opening in the dimension line. Different styles may be used for dimension text, such as decimal or fractional form, or other formatting choices that we'll look at later. Sometimes the text of a dimension can't fit between the extension lines with the dimension lines. In these cases, the dimension lines might be brought to the outside pointing in with the text in the middle, or if the text still won't fit, it can be brought to the outside too so there's nothing in the space between the extension lines. Dimension text should be centered in the middle of the dimension line both horizontally and vertically. The exception would be if there are several dimensions stacked together and the text needs to be staggered to avoid overlapping text. Dimensions on a drawing may be shown in unidirectional or aligned style. The unidirectional method means all the dimensions read right side up, and it isn't necessary to turn your head or the page to read any. The aligned method means the dimensions are read in alignment with the dimension lines, so some read horizontally and others read vertically. Unidirectional dimensions are generally preferred because they're easier to read and put less strain on the reader. Aligned dimensions are uncommon and are mainly used in architectural drafting to reduce the physical space that the dimensions take up on the page. Some dimensions are necessary to describe the size of a feature of a part. Others are needed to explain the location of a feature. Some dimensions are there to tell us how big something is and others are here to tell us exactly where it is. Chain dimensioning is a style in which dimensions are placed from feature to feature in a string or a chain all the way across the part. There are two methods for chain dimensioning, and the one shown here presents a bit of a problem. When products are manufactured, their dimensions always vary slightly from one product to the next. Engineers specify how much these dimensions are allowed to vary using a tolerance. When a part is dimensioned using the method shown here, the small allowable tolerance in each of the chains of the dimension would potentially accumulate, resulting in an overall length or height for the part that is much too small or too large. That's why we generally use this method for chain dimensioning, 
in which the overall dimension for a side is given, and then all of the chain distances are given except one. We leave one of the chains off because if we show them all, we've technically provided the same information in two different ways, breaking one of our basic dimensioning rules. Leaving one chain out still provides the manufacturer with all the information needed to manufacture the part, with no duplicate information. Again, showing the overall dimension as well as all the chains is an error, because we're giving the same information in two different ways. Another dimensioning style that's different from chain dimensioning is called datum dimensioning, also called baseline dimensioning. In datum dimensioning, all of the part features are sized and located from a single point on the object, usually a bottom corner, called a datum. This method essentially gives each edge, corner, or center point on the object a set of coordinates to locate it relative to the datum. This method of dimensioning is particularly useful in machining operations, where a machine tool is set to an initial home point and then directed to different coordinates relative to that home point to cut or drill into the material. When it comes to dimensioning angles, there are two accepted methods. This first method is called the coordinate method, in which both ends of the angled surface are located by their height and width. If the location of both ends of the slope are known, then it's not necessary to include the measure of the angle. In fact, showing the angle too would be an error, because we would be giving the same information in two different ways. The other accepted method for dimensioning angles is called the angular method, in which the location of one end of the slope is given, along with the angular measurement of the surface. In this method, the second endpoint of the slope is not given. In general, we don't dimension angles like this, by showing the length of the angled surface. Most of the time, this length is not exact, and is the accidental result of precisely located endpoints or angles. The length reported in this dimension is likely a rounded value that will not help the manufacturer produce the part accurately. When dimensioning chamfers, there are a few options. One would be to treat the chamfer like any sloped edge and to use linear dimensions to locate its endpoints as shown here. You might also use the angular method for dimensioning a slope as shown here. Alternatively, you could use a chamfer note. A chamfer note points to the chamfer with a leader line and indicates either the side length and angle of the chamfer or the two side lengths. Arcs and circles are dimensioned in views that show the arc or circle as a rounded feature. Arcs are dimensioned with a leader to identify the radius. In some cases, a center mark is included. Circles should have a center mark and are dimensioned with a leader line to identify the diameter. Small arcs don't generally need a center mark, but large arcs normally do. Arcs are dimensioned by their radius with a leader line touching the edge of the arc exactly, with the arrowhead pointed toward the arc center. Internal arcs like this one are sometimes dimensioned from the center to the curve with the arrowhead pointing out as shown here, or they can be dimensioned using a curved extension line as shown here, but it's generally incorrect to place a dimension on the object itself. It is usually assumed that the curve of an arc is tangent to the straight side it connects with. If this is not the case, then the center point of the arc needs a location dimension in addition to the arc radius. Two terms that frequently get confused are fillets and rounds. Fillets are rounded interior corners and rounds are rounded exterior corners. A round is used to avoid sharp edges for safety in handling. A fillet is used to provide strength at inside corners to avoid parts breaking. Fillets and rounds also help release certain parts from molds when they're manufactured. Both of these features are made using the fillet tool in CAD, and they're dimensioned using the same arc dimensioning techniques described previously. When dimensioning complete circles, the diameter of the circle is given with the diameter symbol in front. Like with arcs, a leader line is used to point directly at the edge of the circle the dimension is referring to, with the arrowhead pointed toward the center. 
While this note tells the reader the size of the circle, the center of the circle also needs dimensions that give its position relative to other edges of the object, usually one in the height direction and one in the width direction. Hole information should be given using hole notes, which communicate lots of information about the hole in a single dimension, such as its size, its depth, and whether it has a counterbore, countersink, or threads. I talk a lot more about this in my lesson on holes and hole notes, so if you want to learn more, check out that video. Cylindrical objects are sometimes dimensioned like this, with several diameters given in a side view, but wherever possible, it's preferred to show the dimensions of rounded edges in the view where they appear round. Note that when a hole or a circle shares a center point with a cylindrical object, location dimensions for the center are not necessary, but when a circular feature is off-centered, the location of its center point relative to the center of the part must be given. An especially tricky drawing feature to dimension is a spline. The shape of a spline is defined by key points along its length, so the best way to dimension a spline is to give the location of key points as coordinates of height and width. This is a great application for baseline or datum dimensioning. When a dimension is repeated several times for similar features, reference dimensions are sometimes used to reduce the number of dimensions on the page. Here, times two is used to indicate that the dimension applies twice, and the reader can find the identical feature on the other end of the part. In other situations, the abbreviation TYP for typical is used to indicate that a dimension applies to the entire part, such as a fillet that uses the same internal radius on all edges of the part. Radial dimensioning is used when the features of a part are more easily sized and located from the center than from an outside edge. Round or cylindrical parts are normally dimensioned in this way. Radial dimensioning rarely relies on linear dimensions. Usually angles, diameters, and radii are used to size and locate part features. Dimensioning drawings can be pretty complicated, so it's important to understand the different rules, guidelines, and acceptable styles used to do it. The entire purpose of making drawings in the first place is to communicate precisely between designers and manufacturers, sometimes halfway around the world. Every situation calls for a unique dimensioning style, and sometimes one rule might contradict another. The best thing you can do in a situation like that is to ask yourself, what is clearest? What communicates the best? If you work with that guiding principle in mind, you'll always produce sharp, clear technical drawings. Thanks for watching. Good luck.